All right, so hi, I'm Kenna McLennigan, and I am just going to pull up my PowerPoint. Let's see. Does everyone see this? Yes. Okay, great. First time in, in Teams, so bear with me if I'm a little delayed here. Okay. All right, so. Um, I'll be talking today about uh, the witch, uh, just the different nuances of the witch or the pagan woman as an archetype in folk horror. Um, so I'll start by saying it, it's certainly tempting to find feminist readings in a genre that's ultimately about heterodox thinking. So such readings um, show that popular feminism can persist in the genre of folk horror, which is rife with older, more traditional ideas. Um, but my aim for this talk is to demonstrate that a number of superficial feminist readings circulate around pagan women in folk horror. So I would submit that this perspective is often misguided and ultimately intellectually irresponsible. Um, so I'm working through a number of, of examples and I'll argue that as scholars of folk horror we must use specific religious contextualization and critical feminist pedagogy to foster media literacy when it comes to the pagan woman as folk horror archetype. So there we go, got rid of that little bottom bar there. So let's begin with a beloved meme about Midsummer. Um, so this is one that's been pretty highly circulated. This is an image from Arrested Development. Um, and it's kind of where this um, phrase came from on um, social media, the good for her kind of uh, genre of films. And this is certainly kind of a, a qualifier that's been added to a number of folk horror films, including Midsummer. Um, and so I'm sorry to give away some of the ending, but it's, you know, hopefully people have seen it by now, um, that Danny, the protagonist um, at the top, shown at the top there, she, and, and it's implied that she joins this uh, cult by the end of the film. And some of these, um, some online reception has been quite positive about um, viewing this kind of cathartic experience at the end of the film as uh, a feminist, um, seeing it as feminist text and reading it as a liberating moment. Um, but it's incredibly important to point out that the cult that she is joining is a white supremacist cult and that we cannot see her uh, choosing between her trauma and the only group that has offered her shelter as feminist liberation. Um, so I would say this is not limited to just social media discussion. There are actually in popular media outlets, there's um, a lot of headlines as you can see that, that call Midsummer a feminist text. So I bring this particular audience reception to your attention because it's emblematic of an analytical trend in which pagan women and folk horror are seen as liberatory figures. So I just wanna emphasize that that's not inherently true and we should question any complacent feminist theories that seek to identify the pagan woman as subversive in a genre that's not disposed to liberate her in the first place. So in short, to assess the witch as an archetype in folk horror or the pagan woman more broadly, and her political potentials, we have to reckon with the political underpinnings of the genre itself. So let's turn to a classic text of the Unholy Trinity to examine the political potentials of the pagan woman. So Tanya Kurzwinska in her, dis her discussion of a landscape in the genre wrote about how the character coding of the Wicker Man, quote, is pointedly directed to the libertarian counterculture um, as a figure of ridicule and contempt. Nothing could be more timely and fitting than the sacrifice of an agent, agent of repression, a man who is horrified by the sight of a young woman jumping naked over a fire, placed at the center of a circle of standing stones, and who does not yield to his sexual urges, despite the best efforts of a witchy seductress pictured at the top left here. Um, so I, I think it's interesting that this is largely the commentary that we see uh, when it comes to the Wicker Man, um, especially because... It seems to me that this is selectively identifying Sergeant Howie as repressed and oppressive in his gaze when Lord Summerall himself is profiting off of native, native Scottish people who've been subject to colonization at the hands of his family for generations. So I just wanted to 
bring that kind of narrative of colonization and exploitation to the fore to show that the community values for capital gain, um, just to note this uh, fertility cult wants to make a human sacrifice in order to ensure a plentiful harvest that ultimately serves their community economically, but benefits Lord Summer Owl above all else. Um, and that discussion is often left out of this film. So typically, discussions of counterculture and sexual liberation ensue, which are incredibly relevant, but I think must come with a further acknowledgement, um, which is that these sexually liberated pagan women are almost always faced with a non-choice. So in this case, Willow must work to seduce Sergeant Howie to distract him and contribute to a deception that's ultimate, that ultimately economically benefits Lord Summer Isle. So her sexuality is thus directly tied to his material health, his material wealth. So that being said, I have to agree with Kurzweinska's overall point, which is that whether one's the whether the film's nostalgia is considered conservative, with a small c, or subversive, depends on the interpretive framework that viewers bring to the film. So this is something that we have to do critically when we're dealing with an unholy trinity of films that are squarely in the category of sexploitation, um, which is a mode that cannot be easily recuperated by feminist discourse, but can surely be analyzed by it. So with this in mind, let's turn back to Adam Scoville's influential thoughts on the political dispositions of the genre to see this point. So he writes that folk horror is the violent rejoining of tradition, which on paper seems almost conservative. Yet it even subverts this reading by often summoning up pre-Christian values rather than more purely traditional ideologies, a strangely progressive form created through a conservative mechanism. So here Scoville discusses folk horror as working with a conservative mechanism and being, quote, strangely progressive. But this is not always the case. Um, in fact, my, my critique is part of a larger ideological discussion of hegemonic beliefs uh, within the academy. So as scholars, we readily embrace feminist critique as a righteous endeavor, um, as it most certainly is. And yet when feminism is deployed in a more complacent manner, as in the popular reception of the witch, uh, which is my main uh, example for today, it's not disavowed in folk horror scholarship um, as widely as it should be. So before we turn to the central example of the witch, uh, let's get a sense for some of the discourse around witch feminism. So Kristen J. Soleil writes in Witches, Sluts, and Feminists, like many millennial women, I see a reclamation of female power in the witch, slut, and feminist identities. Each of these contested words conjure and counter a torturous history of misogyny, and each in its own way can be emblematic of women overcoming oppression. So this quote represents a more utopian version of the pagan woman, but later in the book, uh, Soleil mentions a caveat that although the witch is, quote, viewed as a symbol of female power, she is equally a symbol of female persecution. But more than this, I think we should be assessing the specific religious and historical context of each pagan woman to determine the viability of calling this archetype feminist or even subversive. So while a, a deluge of media has been dedicated to the feminist analysis of the witch, it's difficult to interpret the end of this film as feminist liberation. So as a result of the onslaught of the feminist praise in the media, as we can see some of it here, um, the director, Robert Eggers, said in an interview, I didn't set out to make a feminist empowerment narrative, but I learned that writing a witch story is one and the same. So this misguided generalization about the witch prompts a thousand caveats, such as when a Puritan girl is forced to choose between God and the devil. Um, according to the psychoanalytic logic, every depiction of a woman stems from patriarchal construction. And according to statements like Eggers and self-proclaimed witch feminists, anything doesn't conform that doesn't conform to the presumed patriarchal norm, uh, this in itself is a problematic premise, must be feminist. So religious studies, in, I would say, is an essential part of the intervention upon this conclusion that a witch's story is inherently feminist. So one of the most compelling representations of the witch in recent years comes in the unexpected form of a Puritan teenager. So this young woman is Thomason, as I'm sure many people know, uh, the eldest daughter of the family, which has been banished from their Puritan plantation and the folk horror film, The Witch from 2015. So it's in their exile that they begin to experience increasing 
familial loss, uh, dysfunction at the hands of a scarcely seen witch in the forest that surrounds their new isolated home. And Thomason is increasingly alienated from her highly religious, religious family in large part due to her mother's resentment, which ultimately leads to her joining a coven of witches. So many critics have read this ending as liberating. A seemingly innocent girl eschews the puritanical family structure for a life in which she subverts that very structure through her embrace of the occult. But how can this reading have any feminist clout when Thomason only exchanges one patriarchal structure for another, namely this patriarchy of Satan who this coven worships? Thomason is thus an important representation of the witch as the potential implications of her claiming that identity are muddied by Ersatz feminist readings. So Thomason's story is one that is indicative of a larger shift that needs to take place in the scholarship on female representation in full horror. She may not be deemed a witch or a pagan woman until the very end of the film, but even then she sketched from popular belief, the folklore of the witch that circulates the legacy of the persecution of the satanic witch while not attending to the pluralized understanding of the witch today, which is why I've used this broader term of the pagan woman. So um, Laurel Swi Swizzler's detailed account of the historically accurate Puritan prayers and teachings um, sheds light on the ways in which the religious studies is crucial to the assessment of the pagan woman. Um, and the pagan re pre prefix, she argues, is one that cannot be thrown around lightly. And uh, she attends to this issue uh, by talking about the specific prayers that are used throughout the film. And indeed, people might be able to remember that um, there's a note at the beginning of the film that says it's all based on um, manuscripts from the time uh, in which the film is set. But I would even, um, let me just read these quotes uh, and then I'll talk about them a bit more. So first, uh, the, what really summarizes Whistler's argument is that she says the issue is not with contemporary feminist witch identity as embracing a powerful cultural symbol, but with the production, projection of that identity onto real women accused of witchcraft in the past. And then she goes on to say, as offering a template for feminist alterity, the witch is no longer understood as the terrorist she was to the early moderns. In contemporary pagan and feminist revisionings, she's the opposite of everything Christianity once ascribed to her. But I would even push this last quote a little farther. So although contemporary feminist revisionings of pagan women are not wholly informed by the fear-mongering of Christian officials, they're hardly inscribed with feminist ideology implicitly. So in the vein of Swizzle's work, I would urge scholars to be skeptical of reading the pagan woman um, archetype as feminist, especially when she's confined to what we can recall Scovell calls a conservative mechanism. So I just want to say in saying this, I, I want to emphasize I, I don't devalue neo-pagan women or underestimate the liberatory power of spiritual practice or unorthodox ways of knowing that have been systematically suppressed and often in violent ways. Um, so I want to acknowledge practitioners of religions such as Vodun, Candomblé, Hoodoo, Yoruba, Santeria, Animism, Shamanism, and all of their forms um, as a gentle and ripe for political transgression. Um, so my point in, in, not, in invoking pagan women in the broadest sense of the term is to indicate that we cannot do away with specific religious contexts if we're to examine the women in these films who embrace particular religious configurations and are then heralded by mass media as feminist icons. So like Zwizzler, I'm not advocating the view that all witches are inherently in deference to patriarchy. Rather, I'm urging folk horror scholars to embrace feminist media literacy and heterodox religious studies, both as essential to their pedagogy and their research. So it's been my project to ensure that we do not fall into the trap of seeing this subgenre and the archetype it loves to depict, a pagan woman, as indiscriminately progressive, liberating, and feminist. And that's it from me. Thank you so much.